My name is Pam Shebess. Okay. And are there any players or seasons that stand out in your memory? Oh, there are tons of players that I would be remiss if I started naming them because I'd probably forget. Like the goaltenders, uh, Georges Gagnon, I remember, was such a character. Uh, Joel Martin, obviously, has been here forever. Uh, Marty Turco, who was assigned here by Dallas, uh, was quite the, quite the goaltender, and he was a fan favorite. Um, his jerseys always went for a lot of money when they had the auctions. <laughs> um, there are a lot of the players, a lot of the ones who settled around here, especially the uh, Kevin Shamahorns, the Neil Mead Moores, those types. I actually did uh, have an interest in the K-Wings. I was a French teacher in White Pigeon High School, and I had season tickets to the K-Wings. Bob Wagner covered the first 11 years of the Kalamazoo Wings, and when he retired, they were looking for someone to cover hockey and tennis. And since I had season tickets, I thought, hmm, get to see these games for free. <laughs> and, then, um, and I play tennis. And so I thought, perfect job, and I was lucky enough that they did hire me. Um, I guess we kind of covered that one, uh, what circumstances led to the assignment. Um, so which years did you cover the Kiwi team? I started in 1985, and I was a full-time at the Gazette covering them uh, for 25 years and then I retired and then I was a freelancer for five years until they decided that they would not go with freelancers anymore they would use the press releases so it's been at least 30 years and now I write feature stories for the Kalamazoo Wings website which is much more fun than covering the games When the teams were on the road, I went a lot at first, especially the first 10 or 15 years. Uh, they played the Muskegons, Fort Wayne, Flint, Saginaw, and they were pretty close for road trips. Um, some of them I enjoyed a lot more than others. The f it was interesting to see the way the fans reacted to the different team, the visiting team, the away team, um, and then to see how different it was when they came to our barn, as the K-Wings always called it. When I first started covering the K-Wings, there was a bit of a discussion on how we would do the interviews after the game. At first, they said, we don't know that we want you in the locker room. And I said, I really don't want to go in the locker room. <laughs> I've smelled locker rooms before. <laughs> and I said, no, that's quite all right. Um, and we decided that there is a place right outside of the locker room in a hallway that I would ask for different players who would come out and I would interview them then. Uh, the good thing is most of them were taller than I, or all of them were taller than I, and so I could just look up. I didn't have to look, you know, at that. I could just look up. Uh, some wore towels, some wore their actual um, jerseys and, and pants, uh, and some just kind of streaked by. But as long as you're looking up, that's fine. <laughs> Probably the best one is obviously the Colonial Cup Championship. Um, Bob Wagner, who covered the wings before me, had, got to cover two championships. <laughs> and I always gave him a hard time after he retired and said, wait, you have two and I have none. And then 2006, uh, they won the Colonial Cup. And we went to all the away games uh, there that the K-Wings I mean, they swept all the way to Danbury, Connecticut, and my husband and I decided to go to Danbury because they had a chance of actually winning the cup there. Um, I was sitting in the press box next to the commissioner, Richard Brosal, at the time, and he said, are you going? And I said, well, yeah. <laughs> so he said, are you flying or driving? And I said, no, we're going to drive. And he said, we need someone to take the Colonial Cup to Danbury. And I'm going... Okay, <laughs> and 
So then he said, would you consider taking it? And I said, well, let me talk to my husband. <laughs> so we talked about it and we decided that, yeah, we would take it. Um, unfortunately, I think it was Muskegon had won the cup before and somehow misplaced the crate that it was in. So we got a packing, one of those packing quilts, wrapped the uh, cup in it, put it in the trunk, had to wear gloves, white gloves to handle it. And I said to my husband, every time you park, back in so no one can get to the trunk. <clears throat> and then we took it to Danbury, um, went in, told them that the cup was there. Guy came out and I said, here are the gloves. He says, gloves, we don't need gloves. Threw the quilt off, grabbed the cup and took it in. <laughs> and it was wonderful watching them win there. It was, it was magical, it really was. And the interesting thing was Coach Mark Reeds at the time was all by himself. I tried to track him down for quotes and he was in a room all by himself. And I said, why aren't you in the locker room drinking the champagne and smoking the cigars? And he said, no, he said, this is the player's time. They're the ones that want it. And I wanna let them have the time to enjoy it. So that probably impressed me more than anything. It was, those players got along so well. I mean, after a game, you could go in the locker room, win or lose, they would be talking to each other, they'd be high-fiving, they'd be working out together, uh, they encouraged each other off the bench. It was really like a family, it really was. And I credit Mark Reeds with that, and Nick Bootland at the time was the captain. And between the two of them, they really had a, a homey atmosphere, a family atmosphere. Uh, and some of those guys were characters. It, it was fun, it was really fun. In Danbury, they had a very vocal section um, that I guess was notorious among whatever league it was in before. And Danbury, um, I have to say, before we got there, one of our editors decided it would be a good idea for our sports editor to write a really, you know, we're going to trash the trashers type of column. And Danbury was supposed to do the same thing. Well, our sports editor did what he was supposed to do, Theirs, theirs took a leave of absence, and so someone who never covered the team actually wrote a very nice article. And when we went, when I was at the arena, I actually had security. They put security with me so that the fans wouldn't do anything to me to harm me, I guess. Uh, even when I went in to talk to interview some players, um, I had a security person with me. And they were, the one section was, I mean, I don't know. I don't even know how to, how to describe it. And they were really on Joel Martin. And I credit him so much with the job he did in spite of hearing all the slurs and the names that they called him. And it was an experience. I think over the years, the hockey in general has improved. I think players are in much better shape. They uh, take care of their bodies a lot better nutrition-wise. They work out all summer. Uh, back in the 80s, when I first started covering the K-Wings, um, a lot of times players would come out of shape. It would take them at least a week to get back into shape. Uh, so they, and now they come where they step right in as if they hadn't stopped playing at all. I think the equipment is a lot better. Um, I remember back in the days when most of the players did not wear face shields at all or any kind of shields. Uh, there were still a few players back in that day that didn't have to wear helmets. They were grandfathered in, so you could see them flying along with the hair. Um, but I think just in general that the conditioning and the equipment are the ones that have improved the most. I think the fact that, first of all, 45 years is a long time, and there aren't many franchises that can say that. Uh, the fact that Ted and Martha Parfit owned the team for so long is unbelievable. Uh, there are very few franchises that could ever say that. Um, 
if you look back, actually there's only been three owners in the 45 years. The Parfits uh, for two years, Keith Decker, then the Parfits brought it back and then went into partnership with Bill Johnston and the Greenleaf and then they eventually took it over. So I think that's one of the things and the fact that it's a small arena, it's one of the smallest ones around, it's very homey. People who come here from out of town mention that there's not a bad seat in the place and that they actually feel like they're part of the action because they're not way up in the nosebleed section. Could, could you talk about the, the interim owner? I forgot the name. You Keith Decker. Keith Decker, yeah. Um, what's his background? How did he end up with this, with the K-Wing? Well, Keith Decker owned the Madison Kodiaks of the United Hockey League. And when Parfitts, in 2000, Dallas and the K-Wings could not come to an agreement on another affiliation, another year of affiliation, um, mostly money-wise. And, I mean, it actually cost a lot to be a franchise of an NHL team. And so things kind of fell apart, and then Parfitts decided to just retire. The Booster Club went out and had a pep rally saying, we want a hockey team, we want a hockey team. And Keith Decker heard that or found out about that at the time he was looking to move his team to another venue. And so he decided then to move the Madison Kodiaks to Kalamazoo. Uh, Mr. Parfit decided to let him use the name K-Wings, and that's how it actually got to be. Um, he would travel to all the home games from Madison, Wisconsin, and it got to be... Uh, pretty much of a, a travail for him to do that. And so then he, uh, Parfitts bought it back and then went into the partnership. One of the, one of the funniest things that ever happened when I was covering the Kalamazoo Wings uh, was Mel Engelstad, who was a fan favorite. He was a fighter, uh, usually in the locker room with their lockers or where they keep their things, they have their first initial and then their last name. And for him, M for, Matt, for Mel, Engelstad didn't fit, so his ended up Mangler. <laughs> and so that's kind of his nickname. But he was the enforcer. We were playing Fort Wayne at the time. And Eric Boganicki, who was a young player, who actually ended up in the NHL, but with Fort Wayne, uh, was much smaller than Mel, kept irritating him and trying to get him into a fight, trying to goad him into a fight. So finally, Mel just turned around and kissed him smack on the lips and skated away. And uh, Boganecki got a roughing penalty and Mel got an unsportsmanlike conduct and was eventually suspended for a game. And after the, after the game, I talked to Mel and I said, I've got to ask you about that kiss. And he says, well, he was so, so small that I don't, that I decided to tell him just to kiss off. <laughs> so um, that for, will always stick in my mind when I think of Mel. Um, and there was a referee, Sam Sisko. Every time he came, fans would cheer him. They would, he was stunned. And he would be uh, head of a referees where he would uh, look at the referees then after he retired and grade them on their performances. And I often asked him what he thought when he came to Kalamazoo and he said it blew his mind because it was one of the first times he'd ever been cheered. He said it was so different. Uh, and there was also a linesman named Luigi Cortese and fans loved him. He was a small Italian looking, you know, kind of like a, a Mario <laughs> type of guy. And he had a great voice and he'd sing the national anthem before the games and fans would go nuts. Uh, over those two, and those are probably the only two officials that I ever saw the fans not give a hard time to. When the Kalamazoo Wings affiliated with uh, the Minnesota North Stars, then eventually that split up into the San Jose Sharks and the Dallas Stars. Kalamazoo affiliated with Dallas and eventually changed their colors from the red, white, and blue to the green, white, black, and gold. Uh, that came with a lot of controversy among fans. A lot of fans did not like it. And then Mr. Parfit was such a team player that when the IHL was expanding, they asked him, 
they thought Kalamazoo was too small of a market. So they asked him if they would change the name to Michigan K Wings, um, which he did, which I personally did not like. And I think I came out with a column that mentioned that I thought that it wasn't very good because it lost its identity. Uh, Michigan could be anywhere. A lot of people thought then it was Grand Rapids. Um, but eventually then, it came back to the Kalamazoo Wings, which made me very happy. And there was actually a female who played with the K-Wings, played one game. Her name was Molly McMaster, and she got the okay from the league, the UHL, to play uh, one game with five different UHL teams. And she was there for colon awareness. And the, the funny part of it was, well, she was actually good. She practiced with the team before the game, uh, for a couple days. She was a defenseman with the New York Women's League. And one of the giveaways was uh, a little um, type of enema. <laughs> but it was like a fuzzy one, like a, almost like a bobblehead um, gave it out. But the, she's the only female that ever played with the K-Wings in their 45-year history. Probably one of the worst stories there were two really bad stories that I, I just was heartbreaking for me to write. And one of them was when Adirondack was in town in 2006, um, their coach, Mark Potvan, committed suicide at the hotel right near or fairly close to Wing Stadium. And the players were stunned, to say the least. Um, the game was obviously postponed. But to do the story and to talk to people in, involved or connected with, and Mark Reeds was the coach at the time, um, touched him very deeply. A lot of the players were touched very deeply. And that was, that was a hard story to write, to try to give him um, kind of the honor he was due for being such a great coach, uh, but also then for committing suicide. <laughs> Uh, the other hardest one was when Mr. Parfa died. And just all the memories that people had, you know, talking with them, reliving all those moments. And thank goodness he got to see a Colonial Cup uh, the, the year before he died. So that was especially special. Um, so a few years back, you were honored by the ECHL. I don't remember the specific award, but you were given a, like a lifetime achievement. I was, it was a, a media, media of the year award. I was, which was really a surprise um, and was very special. Uh, I was very, very surprised. Um, I was the first female to receive that award and there have been others since, um, but uh, that kind of came out of the blue to me. And also then um, I was given the um, Al. Oh, Al Genevieve. Al Genevieve. Yeah. Um, I also received the Al Genevieve Award uh, for distinguished service, I guess, to hockey in general. And I thought Al was a great guy, and I have done several, had done several interviews with him, uh, and so that was also very special.